Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and you're listening to episode 96 on Decapods with Carrie Schweitzer of Kent State University. Firstly, if you want to know where we've been for the last few months, I'll post a Facebook update explaining what's been going on, uh, but we hope our live stream of the Paleontological Association's annual general meeting earlier this month had been enough to keep you entertained between episodes, and full recordings of those presentations will be made available soon. Whilst at that conference, the Paleontological Association awarded us our third outreach grant for an entirely new Paleocast-led outreach project, full details of which will emerge over the coming months. I'd therefore like to take this opportunity to thank Palace for their continued support of our rather unorthodox projects. With this new one, we hope to be able to engage with an entirely new audience, but it should be something that everyone can enjoy. Anyway, back to introducing this episode. It's a long one, so the less time I spend chatting, the better. It's another listener request, so we do read all your messages and arrange interviews where we can. We love receiving all of your comments and reviews, so please keep them coming in. Carrie covers a lot of ground in this interview, and I learned lots of new things right from the very start. And similarly, if you learn anything new from this episode, or just enjoy the discussion, liking and sharing on social media will always be appreciated. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, Carrie. Thanks so much for joining us today. No problem. I'm glad to do it. Okay. As with every interviewee we have on, we like to know a little bit about you. So can you tell us about your route into paleontology, please? I think like most kids, I was interested in dinosaurs and other fossil organisms. My parents took me to our local natural history museum in Cleveland, and I loved it. And I also had a couple of library books and my own books. I had one called something like 50 million years of horses that I, that I really liked and some dinosaur books. Uh, The dinosaur book that I had had Mary Anning in it. And so I, I got interested in paleontology relatively young, then through middle school and high school kind of got away from it doing teenager things um, Mm -hmm. and majored in and majored in biology um, as an undergrad. And then I came back to the paleontology. Okay. And what would you be doing if you weren't a paleontologist? I would be doing something in natural history. I I would really like plants. I loved my uh, plant class when I was an undergrad. So that would be, that might be one thing. Uh, Certainly natural history oriented. I also like to read about epidemics and diseases. So that's another possible route that I might have taken. So, with an interest in dinosaurs and also horses, why did you choose or why did you end up studying decapods? Well, in, as an undergraduate, I took invertebrate zoology and I loved it because invertebrates are so diverse. They're less studied than other organisms. And I think I just really love the diversity and the interesting aspects of uh, different body plans in invertebrates. And so, when I looked at graduate schools, I found that invertebrate paleontology in many ways was more accessible. There's, there was more to do. Many groups like decapods at the time, that was the mid nineties, weren't receiving very much attention. And it was kind of a wide open area to study at that time. And did you just see like uh, some PhDs offered in decapods and thought, yes, that's the one for me? Or did you actually go out there and say, hey, I want to look at these decapods. Is there anything we can do together? No, I think I looked at graduate programs and found, okay, that's an area that they're studying that needs a lot of work. And I do like arthropods. Who doesn't? And so that's (laughs) what I did. Yeah, right. Okay, I think we should just make it clear for everyone exactly what a decapod is. So we might know them as crabs and lobsters, but what are the synapomorphies, the characters that unite this group together? What are those? Decapods are united by having a dorsal carapace that basically fuses the head 
and the thoracic or the middle part of the body. So this carapace covers, that's what people think of as the shell that covers the body. They all have two pairs of antennae. Now that's true of all crustaceans, but decapods have uh, three additional pairs of cephalic appendages, basically mouth parts. They have mandibles and a couple other uh, very small appendages that they use to manipulate food. Then they have eight pairs of thoracic appendages, three of which are modified into more mouth parts. So these guys have a ton of mouth parts. And if you watch them feed, they're waving them around and they use them to grind up their food. And then the other five of the eight pairs of thoracic appendages are modified into uh, what we would call walking legs, which can include the claws. Another aspect that unites decapods is that they all have a pleon, which is sometimes called the abdomen, or people might recognize as the tail. If you eat a lobster tail, that's the pleon. It always has six segments plus a tail fan. Sometimes it's really obvious, like in a lobster, and other times it's much reduced, uh, such as you would see in a crab. Yeah, because I never realized that the, the pleon of a crab, its tail is is tucked up underneath the um, the carapace, isn't it? Right. It's, yeah, it lays flat against the uh, underside of the carapace. And it can be quite variable in crabs. Sometimes it's quite large. Well, in females, it's larger. Sometimes it's quite small. But if you peel it back, you will actually find that there's little uh, swimmerettes, there's little appendages even on those segments. Oh, wow. Even, yeah. even though they don't use them? For... Well, they do. They, they're modified in males, have two pairs that are uh, called gonopods, and they're basically used to, for sperm transfer. And in females, they wave those little appendages, and that keeps the egg mass oxygenated. Wow. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're like, what, two questions in, and we're all, already into like right. crazy details that I had no idea about. I never knew yeah. that crabs had all of those things just like they, tucked underneath. Yep, they do. And every so often you can get the male gonopods preserved as fossils. We've seen that a couple of times anyway. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I just, there's so many little avenues to just go down right now. But um. Right. Well, that's one reason why I think I found them so interesting. There's all these body parts, which every arthropod has, but in these uh, decapod crustaceans, it turns out they're extremely variable across that group which makes them very interesting. Well, despite all of that variability, you listed off about uh, 10 characters that unite the decapods together. So historically, have have um, the decapods been a really well-established group? Like you, you look at a fossil and you're like, hey, that's definitely a decapod because it has all of these characteristics. I would say yes and no. And the reason I say that is that in the Paleozoic, there are several groups of crustaceans that really look like lobsters, but they're not. They don't have, they, they have typically more appendages. They don't have the right number of appendages. They have slightly different segmentation. So in general, yeah, if you see something, you can say, yeah, that's a lobster, that's a crab. But but there are some exceptions, especially in the Paleozoic, and that's an area we're still trying to figure out. You know, who who did the decapods arise from, uh, and what happened to these other groups? Well, we'll look at the fossil record in a moment. But first, can we just establish which crustaceans are actually included in decapods, other other than crabs and lobsters? All the shrimp, um, hermit crabs. Squat lobsters, which a lot of times people don't know what those are, but they do eat them in Asia. Crayfish, and by crayfish, I mean like American usage of crayfish, the freshwater guys that look like little lobsters. And there, there are, I should say there are also several types of lobsters. And uh, which crustaceans would we know of that aren't classed as decapods? Isopods, which uh, are called pill bugs or wood lice, at least in the U.S. Um, barnacles are crustaceans, which often surprises people. Fairy shrimp, um, clam shrimp, krill, which look a lot like shrimp, but they don't have the exact segmentation that decapods do. Um, ostracods, 
and mantis shrimp, which a lot of people know about because there's all kinds of great videos of them smashing things. One of one of my favorite facts to tell people is that isopods and wood lice are actually uh, crustaceans because I don't think a lot of people realize that you get terrestrial crustaceans. Right. They're not that common, but they do exist. Isopods are, are probably the most abundant, but there are some terrestrial decapods. Yeah. What other ones are there? There are several groups of crabs. They mostly live in the tropics, I think, because they like it warm and wet. They do have to stay moist. They often live in epiphytes, these uh, plants that grow on trees because the epiphytes trap water. And so they'll often live associated with epiphytes. So crabs up trees. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And the coconut crab is one that does that too. That's a hermit crab that doesn't actually uh, carry a snail shell, but it will climb up trees also. And they're big. Yeah. I've I've seen some videos of those that can get giant. Yeah. Um, okay. So what are the, the main differences between a lot of these groups of decapods? I would say the most obvious difference tends to be in the development of the claws. Um, some have huge claws like your standard lobster, which in the U S we would call the red lobster lobster. Cause there's a restaurant chain that has those. So they have the really big pair of claws and then they have two smaller pairs of claws. There are also lobsters that don't have any claws, and those are commonly called spiny lobsters or slipper lobsters. In the U.S., if you eat lobster tails, it's typically a spiny lobster, and people are always surprised by that because that's a lobster with no claws. Shrimps tend to have little teeny tiny claws. Either the first three pairs of their walking legs have claws, or it could be only the first and second. And that helps you to classify what kind of shrimp that it is. Crabs and relatives have one large pair of claws. And many times their walking legs are modified for perhaps swimming, uh, digging, walking. Some of them will actually carry sponges or other animals on their back as a means of camouflage. So you get a lot of uh, differentiation in the claws and the legs. And as we talked about earlier, in the crabs, the pleon is held against the sternum, whereas in shrimps and lobsters, it extends out the back as an obvious tail. So there's lots of differences. Uh, How does that translate into differences in ecology, so how they live? Typically, in today's world, clawed lobsters live in deeper water. And we think that might be as a result of competition with crabs, which are tending, in general, to inhabit shallow water environments. Uh, The only terrestrial decapods are crabs. Freshwater, we have crayfish and some crabs and uh, a few shrimp. So really, they inhabit a broad variety of environments in general, although we do see specializations. Um, Another group that is not necessarily well known to the general public are called ghost and mud shrimp. In Australia, they call them yabbies, and they live in mud flats. That tends to be their main environment. They live in some other areas, but mud flats are typical for them. And in terms of diet, are they all doing similar things? Or I imagine most decapods are just eating like little bits and pieces that they can find, scavengers. Yes, I think scavenging is the most broad type of eating habit. On the other hand, there are many that are specialized for certain types of predation. And one type are the box crabs. They have a claw that people liken to a beer can opener back from back in the day. And wh- they have a hook on one of their uh, fingers. They put that into a snail and they crush the snail open by chewing at the aperture of the snail. They basically peel it and then they rip out the snail and eat it. So there are some specializations for predation. Other crabs have what look like little suction cups little cup-shaped structures on the tips of their fingers, and they use that to scrape algae off of rocks. Um, lobsters, the one, the clawed lobsters, they have what's called a crusher claw and a cutter claw. And the crusher is just what it sounds like. It's big and robust, and they use that to crush. And then the more slender cutter claw is used to tear apart uh, flesh into smaller pieces that the mouth parts can then handle. 
I'm pretty excited to um, talk about uh, evidence for this kind of ecology and predation in the fossil record, but I think that um, we should first establish a bit about the fossil records of uh, the fossil record of decapods on the whole. Uh, when do we see the first decapods in the fossil record? When did they evolve? We think late Devonian. Most evidence right now shows that there are late Devonian, early Mississippian, uh, there's a lobster, it's called Paleopalamon. And there are two different shrimp that are reported from about that same time. Now, the shrimp fossils are not great. They, they do appear to be shrimp related to modern shrimp. Paleopalamon is better preserved and it has a carapace, it has claws, so it seems to be a legitimate decapod. The problem is that we don't have them again really until the Triassic. There are a couple questionable permeable Permian occurrences, but you don't really get uh, well-recognized decapods again until the Triassic, and then they start to um, then they start to radiate. And is Paleopalamon the first? crustacean in the fossil record a, a decapods oh, no. the first crustaceans now no no they go the crustaceans are back into the cambrian and uh, they're really diverse in the cambrian they're strange those uh, tend to be from things like the burgess shale um the xinjiang fauna in china and those are, are receiving a lot of research actually by a lot of people in the uk Derek briggs who's now in the u.s studies those early crustaceans and uh, lots of other people. But they're super diverse in the Cambrian. And these days, we're now including insects as part of the pan crustacea, the larger clade. So that, to me, is kind of interesting also. Yeah, that's that's one that I was thinking about adding in at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so insects are now thought of basically as terrestrialized crustaceans. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that when you think about it, that's not really surprising, is it? Because the well, what we typically think of crustaceans, they live in the water, marine or freshwater environments. And there aren't that many terrestrial ones. Insects are the opposite. They have larval forms that live in the water, but they're mostly terrestrial. So, you know, they've they've sort of partitioned the environment in that way. So in that respect, um, crustaceans are really the dominant life, animal life on the planet, perhaps, in terms of numbers, at least. <laughs> if you, right, yeah, absolutely, if you include insects. Okay, so um, we've established that um, the, the first decapods um, fit pretty much within modern groups. Uh, does that say that they are morphologically conservative? They haven't really changed much uh, over the years, as, as people would say, living fossils, in inverted commas. Yes and no. Um, in many ways, they haven't changed much. They have the claws, the numbers of appendages, the possession of the pleon. On the other hand, if you look at Mesozoic, decapods. There are several groups that are kind of different from modern groups. And I, I think one of the, the best examples of that is that in the Mesozoic, there were many decapods that we call pseudo chelate. They, they have a structure that's kind of like a claw, but kind of not. And, and what I mean by that is that it, it tends to have one large finger and that finger doesn't articulate with another finger like you see in a regular claw. Instead, that finger kind of hits against uh, the hand. It hits against the second to last appendage segment. And there's a lot of debate about what can, what can they do with that? You know, they can't really crush something with it, but they could, they could capture something with it. Do they use it to dig around in the sediment? And I'm not sure we have an a great answer for, for what they're doing with those. And those pseudo chile lobsters uh, were most abundant during the Mesozoic. There's one so-called living fossil group that, that still lives in, in deeper water in the ocean. But those are those groups are mostly extinct. So you have that. And you also have, among the crabs, several extinct groups that really radiated during the Jurassic and dominated coral reef sponge environments during the Jurassic, most of which are now extinct. So I think the answer is kind of yes and no as to whether they're living fossils or not. 
So we found a, a fossil uh, decapod. Hooray! Um, is it always possible to tell uh, which decapod group that specimen belongs to? Not always. Usually you can get at least a tentative placement. It has enough information that you can determine how many claws it has or what its um, its carapace ornamentation can help you decide. There are some groups in the fossil record that we've got allied with, for example, um, the, the hermit crabs. And yeah, maybe, maybe not. Maybe they are, maybe they're not, but it's the best place to put them for now. In general, you can tell whether it was a lobster or a crab or a shrimp. You can usually get that far. If you've only got a claw, that's harder. Uh, usually you can tell whether it's a crab or a lobster, but but not always. And are there any other issues with identifying species? Or That's huge. We wrote a whole paper about that because it turns out that identifying species within Decapoda can be kind of difficult. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is that many, many fossil decapods are known from only one specimen. And I think that's true of, for example, dinosaurs as well. We've only got one specimen. So you don't know if there's, uh, you don't know what the interest specific variation is. You don't know if there's differences between males and females. You, you know, you, you have no information about variation. And that can be difficult. We do know that there's sexual dimorphism in several groups, uh, especially these mud and ghost shrimps. That was not recognized in the past, and we've been able to synonymize species, put them back together as males and females until instead of two separate species. So that that's an issue. One area that we've been researching a lot lately and we're still doing is examining the cuticle, which is what their shell is made out of. And it's made out of protein and calcite, and it's layered. And sometimes those layers peel off, and it can look really different if you've got the outer layer versus the inner layer. There's surface ornamentation, like little nodes and bumps and grooves, and those can look really different depending on how well the cuticle is preserved. If you have a mold of the interior of the cuticle, that even looks different from uh, the cuticle itself. Another issue that I'm worried about right now is that we have a lot of cases where there's more than two species of the same genus named from the same locality. And I wonder if those are sexual dimorphs, juveniles and adults, not sure. So that's an issue as well. I think something else that is a, a, a lot of people don't realize is uh, ontogeny really um, yes. comes into this. And that's how they grow because um, arthropods grow by molting. So each instar, it's called, each stage of their life. In crustaceans, they can have a wildly um, different uh, kind of bodies and ecologies uh, throughout. So say, uh, for instance, a barnacle, like we know that as just a sessile organism that lives at the bottom of a, a ship, for example, but um, in its larval forms, it's swimming about and it looks completely different. How does that, how does that come into it? There aren't a lot of fossilized larvae, although there are some, and we're finding more and more of them. There's a group in Germany that's doing a lot of work on that and finding many examples of larval decapods. Another aspect of that is that when the, we found that when crabs, for example, are smaller, they tend to have different um, body proportions. So as an example, one measurement that we often take is the width uh, of the eyes, between the eyes. And that tends to be wider in juveniles. It tends to be narrower in adults. And if you're not careful, you could interpret that as two different species. Another feature that we see is that in younger uh, crabs, things like spines on the margins, they tend to be bigger and more pronounced. And as they grow, those spines become less and less pronounced. And they can, they can even basically turn into bumps. They're not even spines anymore. So ontogeny is really important when you're looking at these guys to make sure you're not confusing juveniles and adults. So if, you, if often you've got just one species per genus, it's monotypic. Other cases, you've got one specimen 
per species. And then you've also got sexual dimorphism and ontogeny. Is it likely that a lot of um, different species that have been identified are just different variants of the same species? Yeah, I think that's quite possible. Um, that there's a lifetime of work there trying to figure that out. I think that's quite possible. We also have the opposite problem where we have dozens of species in the same genus. And then you start wondering how many, kind of the opposite problem, how many of those are actually the same? And we've named multiple species because they came from a different locality or they're a slightly different age. And sometimes those get referred to as wastebasket genera. You know, you find something that looks kind of lobster-like, it goes in hopoparia, which is a, a common lobster in the Cretaceous. So we, we, have, we have both ends of the spectrum with these, with these issues. So you've mentioned just a couple of fossil species. Were they a lot more disparate in the past? Like they were different, more different from each other uh, then than they are today? You know, that's a question that we're working on right now. We're really thinking hard about that. And I think it depends on the group. So if you look at the so-called lobsters, which is a, a, is a broad catch-all for decapods with claws and with a pretty well calcified carapace and a pleon that extends out the back like a tail, they were more disparate in the past. There's many extinct lobster groups. On the other hand, I think crabs might be more disparate today than they were in the past. We see maybe more body forms, more body shapes, uh, more claw shapes than we did in the past. Then when you take something like mud shrimp and ghost shrimp, they're not really very much different today than they were in the past. When you find fossil ones, you think, oh yeah, that that really looks like uh, the modern ones. So I think it the disparity question depends on which group of decapods you're looking at. Could that be an artifact of sampling and preservation? Uh, because if, for instance, the, the lobsters, which have this uh, huge disparity in the past, they're all living in the environments where they're likely to have their whole uh, diversity preserved, whereas crabs might have been living in environments where they're less likely to be preserved, so therefore you're only getting a limited view of the range of crabs in the fossil record. That's certainly possible. I think it's definitely a, the case with shrimp because you they have such delicate cuticle that we get them preserved basically in two kinds of environments, shale, muds and shales, and lithographic limestone. It has to be a fine sediment that buries them quickly before they disintegrate. So for shrimp, I'm sure that we're not seeing the entire range of uh, morphologies and environments when we look at the fossil record that that has to be true with lobsters and crabs yeah i'm sure i'm sure it's true you know we don't have very very many fossils from deeper water environments uh, for example today we've got uh, lobsters living at a few thousand meters well we don't have any fossils of that environment and so we don't know so I think that the answer is yes. I'm sure that there is some kind of a bias as to where they've been preserved. And I think there's probably a sampling bias. It's really easy to see a fossil lobster. You know what it is. It's recognizable. And they generally tend to be rather large. And the same is mostly true with crabs. Early crabs were pretty small. And I think there's a collecting bias there. People don't know what they they are. They see them, they don't know what they are, and so they don't collect them. So I think that exists. Recently, some people wrote a paper about um, snapping shrimp. Okay, they're, they're not the same as stomatopods, but they, they snap their claws. And in the fossil record, what you find are just the tips, which are maybe a millimeter across, just the tips of their claws. And They've just recently been recognized as such within the last couple of years. And my guess is there's a lot of those out there that people didn't know what they were. And so we don't know about them. Just the tips of the claws. Do you think they might have uh, biomineralized those and they've got a yes. higher preservation potential? Cool. Yes, absolutely. We know, <laughs> we know that other that uh, crabs biomineralize their claws and especially the occlusal surfaces because that's what they're using to crush and feed. And so with these uh, 
snapping shrimp, that pretty much has to be the case. The tips are biomineralized, and so you get them, and the rest of the carapace just, you know, it, it's scavenged, it uh, degrades. But that's, a, that's an interesting um, area of research to figure out what was the fossil or the uh, past diversity of these snapping shrimp, because there have to be more of them. Um, I'm sorry to everyone in the audience that I'm just dragging you all along in this uh, conversation of biomineralization yeah, of arthropod right. cuticles, but this is <laughs> this is the the bit of uh, paleontology that gets me the most excited. <laughs> so you you're just going to have to indulge me. So let's let's talk about biomineralization. So you've said that um, some decapods uh, biomineralize with calcite, so crabs and lobsters. Is that right? But Yes. Others don't, so the shrimps don't do that. Um, does that make uh, a huge difference in terms of the numbers that are preserved and the different environments in which they're preserved? Absolutely. Um, shrimp do biomineralize a little bit. We we did a paper on that looking at shrimp versus crabs and lobsters. And shrimp do biomineralize, but not very much. And we hypothesized that that was uh, an adaptation to swimming. The carapace is much lighter. So if you're going to swim, it's better to have the lighter carapace. What one of our students found was that they biomineralize with calcite, but, it, but it's not really calcite. Calcite's a mineral. So that means it has to have a crystalline structure. And what they're using is an amorphous calcite and that strengthens their cuticle, which was kind of interesting. And we've also found that in certain conditions, the calcite um, mixes, bonds, reacts with phosphate in the environment, and so that you get kind of an apatitic, an appetite-based mineral in their preservation. So if there's a lot of phosphorus present, that helps with their preservation which leads me to geochemistry. And this is an area that we're uh, beginning to look more at because you find decapods really only in certain environments. And as an example, if you find a fossil layer with a lot of clams and snails, you don't tend to find decapods associated with that. Now they must've been living there. They live together in modern environments, but there's something about the geochemistry of those environments that doesn't preserve the decapods as well. Often you find decapods associated with uh, echinoderms and brachiopods. And I don't know what the geochemistry of that is, but I, I, it's real. And that, that tends to be an association that is much more common. Yeah, I, and I'm, again, I'm not sure why, because echinoderms and brachiopods have really different biomineralization from one another and also from decapods. But they are found frequently in association. Sounds like a PhD to me. Send your applications it, into Carrie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's true. You mentioned that um, one of those uh, crabs had uh, the biomineralization at the tips of the claws, and therefore it has a higher preservation potential. So a uh, cuticle isn't uh, homogenous across the whole surface. And also uh, you've got the things like the carapace and the pleon all tucked up together in certain things. So do you often find that um, the bodies preserve um, without the legs or that the legs are found in isolation without the bodies? And how does that affect um, your interpretation of which species it is and, uh, which, and which group it belongs to? Yeah, that, that can be an issue. Typically, you either find the dorsal carapace, the, the shell, not associated with anything. And we, we generally interpret those as molts because the, the animal separates um, to allow the, the, the animal to break out of its old shell. And so we usually find just the dorsal carapace or just claws. And that is undoubtedly due to the better biomineralization of those parts of the body. In lobsters, sometimes you'll find an isolated tail. And we think that might be due to scavenging. The, uh, they get broken apart as an animal scavenges on the carapace. So sometimes you just find tails when you are dealing with lobsters. That affects your interpretation 
profoundly, really, because especially in crabs, one of the um, sets of characteristics that's used to classify crabs has to do with the underside. It has to do with the the tail that's tucked up and the the sternum, which is the surface that the the tail, the pleon, is held against. And sometimes if you don't have that, you can't place the crab in a family or you have a very hard time placing the crab in a family. If you just have claws, honestly, I hate working just with isolated claws. I think they're hard. I think they're hard because a lot of them look similar. There are similar claws in um, lobsters and crabs. We found in the fossil record that there are claws that really look like hermit crabs. And then when you do find them associated with an actual carapace, they're not. They're crabs. So claws are difficult. There are some that are very, very distinctive. And then there are others that are, you know, really just much more generic. And on the flip side of that, can you find uh, specimens that are absolutely pristinely preserved? Like, it just looks like it could just walk away. Yes, that tends to happen in what are called concretions, which are... Uh, round or oval, hard structures that seem to preferentially form around uh, a rotting animal. And that seems to affect the geochemistry so that it makes the concretion, this round structure, harder than the surrounding rock. And it must happen very quickly after the animal is buried, because in those concretions, you do find these beautiful, pristine crabs and lobsters. I uh, I see them on sale quite a yes, lot. Yes, right. Yep, those are the ones you see on eBay. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, do you do you feel annoyed that the public are, are focusing on these beautiful specimens rather than the the uh, the other less well preserved but more interesting specimens? Should they get more attention? Probably not. You know, when you when you think about, you know, wh- why do people want to look at fossils? They want to look at things that are beautiful and complete. And so I, I get why they get most of the attention. Uh, we try as, be- as best we can to educate fellow collectors and fellow scientists about what crabs, lobsters, what decapods look like in rocks so that they'll collect them. So that even if it doesn't look very interesting, collect it anyway, because we might be able to prepare it out. We might be able to determine what it is just based on a small piece of cuticle. Okay. Well, speaking of field work, uh, do you ever get out into the field? And if so, are there any decapod dominated sites? We love doing field work. Um, We're right now talking about going to China next summer to do some work. Uh, The China sites are extremely interesting. I don't know if I would call them decapod dominated, but they have, uh, this is a, a formation of calcareous shale and individual layers, individual bedding planes tend to be dominated by uh, different animals. So you'll have a fish dominated layer. You'll have a shrimp dominated layer. You'll have a layer with cr- lobsters and fish, and that's really all. And then we've mapped other layers that have um, only brachiopods, which is kind of weird. And then we've done other layers that have other types of crustaceans that are um, extinct, for example. And that was fun. Mapping those was really fun because we were able to see that each layer seemed to indicate a mass kill of these of these mostly pelagic organisms. And by having so many of them, you could make these maps with hundreds of specimens. Wow. So what's this place called and where is it and how old is it? And This is in uh, southern China. It's in uh, Yunnan province. It's middle Triassic in age. It's called the uh, Loping fauna. And it's best known, I think, in the world for its fish and these really cute small marine reptiles. They look like mini plesiosaurs, but that's not what they are. They're, you know, there's some other kind of, um, some other kind of reptile and they're very cute and so that's what it's best known for and it's also known well known because it's middle triassic which is when you really start to see radiation and recovery after the uh, end permian events okay and what do the individual layers represent why do they have just um one group preserved at a time what happens in between when it changes 
What's going on? Well, we interpret it, it along with our, our Chinese colleagues who did some of the uh, geochemistry on the layer, and then and they've done much more field work than we have. But we interpret it as being potentially some kind of an algal bloom, maybe some kind of a mass kill that wiped out groups really quickly so that they they all fell to the bottom, were very rapidly buried, and then the environment seems to uh, have gone back to quote normal. We know that there's algal mats. Some of these uh, layers in between the the kill sites have uh, what are interpreted as algal mats. There are also some um, trackways left by some of these marine reptiles. And so it seems like it was a deeper basin inhabited by a a broad diversity of of fish and, and other organisms that was subjected to these sort of intermittent kills. We also, there, there's another aspect to it. We know that maybe storms were bringing in uh, sediments from land because there's plants in this deposit and also terrestrial millipedes, which is really interesting. Wow. To find, yeah, to find millipedes associated with shrimp. Weird. And we really puzzled over that for quite some time and finally decided that the, the millipedes must have been washed in potentially with the plants. Because millipedes really don't, inhabit marine environments. I, we did find evidence of some that kind of live in coastal areas, but you know, not in the ocean. It sounds a really interesting and weird site. Yeah, it is. It, it, it is. It, they're very interesting and they're kind of fun to work on because this is developed in a karst landscape. So you have these conical hills and then there's valleys between them. And the the fossils are in these hills. And so what they do is they get workmen who basically strip off the top of the hill and turn it into a quarry. It's really amazing. And so you just kind of work your way up these karst hills, looking at different layers of fossils. Is the prevalence of decapods at this time uh, significant in any way? Yes. It, it This site documents the earliest or one of the earliest Um, spiny lobsters, the palinurids, and these spiny lobsters are the ones that are often eaten just as their tails. And this is the oldest one. It also documents um, a diversity of shrimp. I think there were three or four different species of shrimp. And in addition to that, there were, there are two or three additional lobsters. Now these lobsters belong to uh, extinct groups, but nevertheless, there they are, and they're some of the earliest members of their group. So, yeah, it's significant in being a diverse early occurrence of decapods. And is there any significance in the composition of the fauna, the different the different groups that you find preserved there? Well, yes. And another interesting aspect of this is that there is three other types of crustaceans associated with the shrimps and the lobsters. One or one group is related to modern ones. They're called mycids and they they look like they look sort of like krill. They're like a little shrimp-like organism. They're not shrimp. And there's about three species of those that we find in this fauna and they're extant. They're still found in the world today. There are two other crustacean groups that are perhaps holdovers from the Paleozoic. And these are the thylacocephalans, which are really strange, strange crustaceans, and a group called the cichlids, which we're working on right now that we think are crustaceans. We're pretty sure they're crustaceans, but we have no idea what their affinities are. So in this middle Triassic fauna, you have kind of an interesting mix of some Paleozoic holdovers and the origin of some modern groups. You alluded to there being a lot of pelagic forms. Are they were they proportionately more abundant than the benthic groups? That's an interesting question that we've thought a lot about. There are some benthic ones. The lobsters would have been benthic. There aren't very many of them as individuals. The shrimp are more abundant, and these uh, other odd groups that I was mentioning are also more abundant. And we suppose that that probably has something to do with preservation in the environment because you find a lot of shrimp and then these these pelagic marine reptiles. So you're getting an overabundance of the pelagic groups 
at the expense of the benthic groups. And maybe uh, one of the things we've hypothesized is that the bottom was kind of anoxic. This is sort of a black carbonaceous shale. So you could have had some anoxic conditions going on on the bottom that made preservation or made inhabiting that area less you know, less good. But it do, I, I think it probably has largely to do with um, the preservation in the site and the environment because you do get a prevalence of pelagic fauna and at the expense of benthic. You also said that there were loads of specimens and you were able to uh, map them out on a bedding plane. What were you able to do with that? What could that tell you? We found that they tend to be clumped, which is not surprising based on modern ecology. Even though they were pelagic, some of them, we would tend to find them clustered together. So we would find these mycid shrimp. They would all be clustered in one part of the bedding plane. And then you'd move away from this cluster and there would be fewer of them, which suggests that they were perhaps swimming in a school or a herd. We also found that the benthic ones, the lobsters, and there was a couple of, of shrimp that were benthic, they also tended to be clustered. So you would tend to find them close together and then you would go into an area where you weren't finding shrimp. And I think that's suggestive of their ecology. They And this is similar to modern organisms. They do tend to live in, in groups or at least associated with one another. Could it not also be a taphonomic thing that after they died, all their bodies got washed together by the currents? Uh, can, can we say that um, the groups that they represent are definitely gregarious? They were all uh, chilling out together as opposed to just being um, pulled together by the currents. Mycids are gregarious. That group does tend to live in swarms. Um, on the other hand, we did a study. We found one slab of lobsters and it was in the collection and we looked at it and we thought these kind of look like they're all oriented in the same direction so we mapped them and in fact they were so that does suggest that there was some kind of current operating in this environment uh, that current was able to pull the lobsters so they were all more or less oriented in the same direction and so some of these associations could be due to bottom currents with these lobsters, there were a lot of them. And that suggested to us anyway that they probably were living you know, more or less together. I don't know if I'd say gregarious because that suggests that they wanted to be together, but they were living more or less in the same general area. And then the current was able to sweep them into an oriented cluster. Have you got any more research questions that you want to ask about the decapods of Loping? We've got a couple ideas about that. Uh, we may be going back to study the isopods. And there's already been one species of isopod described from the region, but there are two or three more, I think, based on the specimens that we've seen. One thing that I would like to know is more about this kind of mixing of the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic fauna. Um, why was this area a place where we have some holdovers from the Paleozoic? What made it conducive to that? Um, how many other sites around the world are there? We do have some knowledge that there might be a similar type of fauna in Europe. So what caused this mixing? of Paleozoic and Mesozoic. How long did the Paleozoic ones hold out? Were they, why, why did they, why were they living together? Were they uh, living in op different kinds of environments? Was there niche partitioning going on? That's a question that I have. Okay, and just to summarize now then, uh, do you think decapods get the attention they deserve? I think they have lately. In the last 20 years, there's been a real resurgence of interest in studying fossil decapods. So there are, there's a good oh, 30 to 50 people around the world right now that are working on decapod paleontology. And that's really different from when I was doing my graduate work, where there were only a few. So right now, they're getting a lot of attention, which I think is good because there's a lot of questions that we need to answer about them, their proclivity to extinction or their ability to withstand extinctions, past diversity versus modern diversity. And those are things that people are looking at now.
So it sounds like there's plenty more research to come out of decapods in the future. Um, there is, yeah. What would you say to anyone who's listening to this and getting excited about decapods, thinking, yeah, this might be something I could uh, look into? Uh, what would you tell them? I would say get a good background in biology, knowing the biology of the animals, their environmental preferences, their morphology is really important, as well as in geology. I would recommend getting some geochemistry because one of the big areas in decapod paleontology right now has to do with preservation. And what are the preservational biases? How are they preserved? What constitutes uh, excellent preservation versus preservation that's not as is good. So I think that some geochemistry is really important. Uh, statistics and multivariate statistics are always important for when you're trying to uh, work out phylogenies. Uh, getting that I should add that getting some background in different phylogenetic methods would be very useful. Understanding Bayesian techniques versus parsimony, I think, would be very good. And those are just two different methods by which you can reconstruct a family tree organisms. Well, that's great advice, but um, from a personal perspective, how has studying decapods been? Oh gosh, I love it. I love doing field work. We've been able to do field work on almost every continent, not Africa. So field work is fun. It, doing museum work is fun because you go into museums and you find specimens that people forgot about. No one's looked at them for a hundred years. And this gives you fresh perspectives on their evolution. So for me, it's been fantastic. And this episode has been fantastic for me as well. So thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. It was really fun. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news.